Wayne Coulter. I'm an evolutionary astrologer, and this is my class on reading the karmic story for Stormy Grace's YouTube Academy. I'm very excited to be a part of this mission of hers. And this class, this video, is going to be a super condensed pistachio nutshell version of the full length webinar I did last year. It was about a four hour webinar. This video will be about 60 to 90 minutes or so where I will be able to share with you the polished method, the nuts and bolts of understanding the karma of your birth chart or one of your, one of your friend's charts. Uh, but if you feel like you wanna go deeper with it, understand some more nuances, see some more chart examples, uh, I recommend visiting my website. I'll put the link below in the show description. And actually that class I have on sale right now, 20% off. So it's a pretty auspicious timing. But anyhow, let's, let's dive into it. So here's the class, Creating the Karmic Story. And the little uh, subtitle here is, If You Understand Your Karma, You Understand Your Life. And I think it was uh, uh, the Dalai Lama or somebody said, one of those famous gurus said, if you want to understand your karma, contemplate your current life circumstances. So history repeats itself is implicit in this. And this is, of course, using the reincarnational model, which is the model I prefer. Um, and there's actually a lot of evidence out there that points to that's what's actually going on here. And I believe you can actually get a feeling for your past life story by looking at specific places in your birth chart, which I'll get to. And it's like, who the heck were you before you were born? Well, this is very precious information because if you start to understand on a deeper level your past life circumstances, you start to begin to understand in a more, let's say, thorough way, your current life circumstances, because history repeats itself. The karmic wave breaks in all of our lives. I think of karma kind of like a skipping record that repeats. You know, the past lives and the current lives, they aren't exactly the same, but there are very obvious, distinct themes that tend to recreate themselves. And you know, all those out there who accept uh, the reincarnational model and that's what's going on, agree that our, our present personalities and those circumstances are rooted in those previous lives, which I was just saying. And all astrologers on the planet, at least I haven't heard one disagree with this, uh, agree that our personalities and circumstances are reflected in our birth charts. So if our current circumstances are connected to our past life, it stands to reason if we accept both of those statements, we're compelled to recognize that our present chart, birth chart, must reflect past life dynamics. And in our natal configurations, there are, let's say, subtle breadcrumbs about who we were in the past life and what we were doing in those lives. And this is meant to be symbolic. This is meant to parallel your past life experience. It's meant to be more of a parable that parallels past life experience so that we can understand a couple things. What it felt like to be you in the past life, that's really, really critical and it can help us to answer some questions why we felt ways that we felt in the current life. And also get an understanding or an idea of what the heck we were trying to learn in the past life. There's a, uh, there's a philosophy that's really baked into the style of evolutionary astrology that ultimately the purpose of life is to grow, learn, and evolve. So I see this as very much a, a school for hard knocks on planet Earth, if you will. You know, uh, So we're in a bit of a kindergarten through 12th grade, to put it simply. So what's the ongoing lesson plan in the current life that is carryover from the past life? We're we've come back, incarnated again, right? We forgot our past lives, so we pass through the veil of amnesia to do it again, to take the test blind. Now, by looking at your chart, it's not like you can find the answers to the test. That would be cheating on the exam. But we can get a sense of what's the curriculum, you know, or what's the class syllabus, or maybe even what's the questions on the exam, which can be tremendously helpful information. Yeah. And by understanding your past life, you, we uncover what it must have felt like to be you, what I said before, and the clues of what it was you must have been learning, okay? Again, history repeats itself. And this is a great skill to polish because, and this applies to astrology in general, not just this style of astrology, but it can help us to develop compassion uh, for ourselves and for other people. But now we put it in the more of a compassion in the, in the overarching soul theme of many lives here. OK, 
okay? So the heart of the technique, okay? First, we understand that there were issues in the past life that were, un were left unresolved, you know, questions on the exam that you left blank or whatever, you know, uh, in the last life or maybe even set of lives, because I think it, sometimes it takes multiple lives to get past one grade in the school, so to speak, okay? Here's the second thing, okay? There must be either a sole intention or an evolutionary need to work on the issue this lifetime, you know, that ripening of karma, okay? And our goal here is to recognize the fingerprints, okay, of those unresolved experiences from those prior lives in the present birth chart. And by deciphering those fingerprints, we can turn them into a very evocative story, okay, that triggers breakthrough of self-awareness within ourselves and our clients or friends, whether you're doing it professionally or just as a hobby, okay? Um, and the reason why, as we'll, as we'll see here, we'll be able to tell a parable, a story, and I feel like that's really important in this work because when you tell somebody a story, it, it connects with them on a heart level, not just on a mind level. Sometimes astrology can be presented in a very dry way. And if we can tell it through storytelling, it brings us into the feeling state of what it must have felt like to be you. And we can understand it conceptually, but we can connect on a deeper level through the heart. Now, here's a little bottleneck of astrology trying to understand what the heck all these symbols and glyphs are. And, and my goal here is to not waste a lot of time sharing this with you. Many of you already know this stuff like the back of your hand. But for those of you who don't, this is something, a little hurdle you'll just have to jump over and you'll have to familiarize yourself with these symbols, what the chart looks like. You can see here on the bottom right, uh, the chart example of Jim Carrey. But here you have all the planets. These are all the symbols for them, the signs, okay? Um, and if you're uh, a beginner, you know, you don't know any of this, I recommend either researching on Google or just taking a screenshot of this so you can study it over time. Okay. So where we want to begin to understand the past life story is to work with what's called the south node of the moon. And the south node is this little horseshoe shaped uh, right here, south node, okay, on the chart. You can see it over here on Jim's chart down here in the third house. The inner wheel is the houses. So the lunar south node, okay. Now all the planets have south nodes, except for the sun, of course. Okay. And they all refer to the past, but it's the moon south node specifically, what's commonly known as the dragon's tail. That's what we interpret. Why? Because moon represents heart. Remember, we're trying to understand what it felt like to be you in the past life. And of course, what that felt like in the past life commonly carries through into the current life. For example, if you have a Virgo south node or you know somebody who does, usually an emotional state associated with Virgo, at least on the negative side, would be a lot of worry and concern, among other things, but those are the primary ones. You know, there can be a lot of anxiety with Virgo south nodes. So worry and concern, and something I would say to a client is, therefore you were born into this current life worried, even though you didn't necessarily have to be. You know, the, the heart remembers, you know, the, the, the emotional, um, I guess the emotions in our astral body or whatever uh, stay there, you know, and, and they're very, they're very charged from lifetime to lifetime, depending on how much focus we put them, put on them. So, and karma is simply habit. So the more habit we had in putting our conscious awareness on those emotions over many lifetimes, the stronger they become and they continuous can continue to influence us over multiple lives. And the South node primarily represents the unresolved wounds of the past life, okay? The tragedies, the limitations, the stumbling blocks from the past, which tend to trip us up a little bit or interfere with our ability to fulfill our soul contracts and lessons in this lifetime. So, um, and, and, the, and one more point about that, is since they were a stumbling block in the past life, we want to focus on the south node symbolism and reading the karma a little bit negatively, describe the symbols a little bit askance, just to see what went wrong. Obviously, our goal here isn't to understand how amazing you were in the past life. You know, you didn't sprout angel wings and ascend. I'm sure, you know, all of us to a certain degree had amazing qualities, which you can also tell from the past life. But where we can really learn is focusing on the negative, at least somewhat, okay? 
because that can give us insight in what we need to resolve in the current life. Okay. So first of all, we want to focus on the sign that the south node is in. And the south node, whatever sign it's in, you know, signs are, are psychological, you know, uh, it's like the intrapsychic processes within us. And it helps to describe the nature of the person and what their lesson plan was in the past life. Okay. And here's a little trick or mind hack that can help you wrap your head around this. The south node sign, you can consider it very similar as a conventional sun sign in your birth chart. You know, so let's say uh, you're an Aries you're in this life. You have, your sun's an Aries. Well, you're headstrong, you're action oriented, you're fiery, you're brave, you're courageous, you know, this stating you positively. And you had those values in the past life if your south node, the moon was in Aries. So you can kind of read it as if it was a sun sign, you know, but in this case, in past life context. And much like your sun in this life, the south node sign describes really core identity and values, because that's what the sun means. It's the center of our identity. It's your self image, your values, it's your sanity, your vitality. It's really the center core of our heads, much so like the south node sign in the past life. And when contemplating the south node sign, it's helpful to, again, slant our understanding of the sign a bit more negatively. We also want to tie in the south node's house. Okay. And the house of the south node actually tells us where in the life this was actually happening, you know, the physical scene. Again, the sign is more internal, it's psychological. The house is locational. It gives us a sense of place that a lot of this, these challenges took place. Okay. Gives us a sense of the where. It's what the person was actually doing in the karmic past and what their life actually looked like from the outside. And it also, also offers us some insights into the circumstances which compelled or constrained the person. Okay. Next, we put the sign and house together. So I just used that example, Aries, you know. So uh, let's understand the headstrong nature of Aries. It's one of the most independent, autonomous signs in the zodiac. It's the sign of the warrior. Okay. So, you know, maybe, uh, for example, maybe they were a literal warrior. Of course, we have to take a look at the rest of the symbols if it supports that idea but they could have been uh, literally in war, you know, a fighter in some way, okay? But if the Aries South Node is in the sixth house, house of service, house of, uh, of hierarchical structures, house of feeling like they're under orders, that feels much more like a literal military life, you know, the Aries South Node in the sixth house. Uh, again, you have to consider the rest of the symbols but I would immediately free associate there if I saw that placement. So that's just a quick example. So notice how much more vivid and precise everything gets when we start to blend and sign and house together to modify and specify each other. And they also limit each other, you know, and each detail we tie into the story brings additional focus because having an area south node in the sixth house is a lot different than having it in the fifth house or the 10th house or the ninth house, you know. You can take it in so many different directions. You know, sixth house feels more military. Fifth house feels like more like maybe a, a famous athlete or something like that because it's the house of sports. Here you have the, the warrior in the house of sports. In the ninth house, ninth house of travel, you maybe have some sort of adventure or, or uh, boat captain or something like that. I mean, you can get pretty silly with the, with the stories, but it brings us into the feeling states. You notice how the, what did it feel like to be those different people? felt very different, but the south node sign is still the same. It's just adding a different location and still providing us with a different feel based on those locations because it does add some extra detail. And that's a really great start, okay? Understanding the south node sign in house, gosh, you could give an entire reading just on those two symbols. I'm, there's much more than that and we can become much more specific and comprehensive. Uh, but that's a great start. And I'll even say, if you only work with that, you're doing just fine, you know. Um, of course, we're going to have to talk about what all the planets and houses and signs mean, but we'll get to that later. Now, we can go deeper, though. When we find a planet conjunct the south node, this further defines the nature of the individual's life energy and circumstances. And much like the south node sign, the planet was uh, deeply integrated with that individual's identity in the prior life, okay? In this case, 
you know, you can view the planet conjunct the south node as you normally would a planet conjunct the person's birth chart sun in the current life, okay? Except again, we continue to tilt our interpretation towards more suboptimal expressions, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, just running on the same example, let's say Aries south node in the sixth house conjunct Saturn. You know, Saturn has a very reality checkish energy. It's, 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 um, it's, it's very grounded in determination and, and realism and uh, order, you know, and restriction and rules. And here we find it in the house of service and the sign of the warrior. This feels much more like this person was a war general, kind of like the stern father archetype. So it can further add some extra information uh, to who this person was. And then we have the planetary ruler of the South Node. And I'll talk about planetary rulerships in a second here, okay, which planets rule, which signs, but each sign has a planet that is said to rule over it. So not only do we wanna look at the South Node sign house, any planet next to the South Node, but we also wanna to look to the planet that rules that sign. So with Aries, the example I keep using here, Mars rules Aries. So we also want to take a look at Mars. Where's Mars on the chart? This is going to provide us with even more information. Okay. And the ruler is seen as an extension of the node itself. And it describes yet another dimension of the karmic story. It can get so detailed and specific, these stories. It's pretty amazing. Okay. And it provides another perspective in the story. And we don't focus on the symbolism of the planet. This is a very important point and not a lot of people get this. Um, I've done follow-up sessions with students and they seem to miss this point and it's really critical. When we're looking at the planet in this example, Mars, you know, um, Mars of course is gonna be in a different sign in a different house usually, okay? There are exceptions, but that's, that's the normal. And we want to consider Mars in this case as just a placeholder for whatever sign and house it's in. Let's say it's in, uh, well, it doesn't really matter, you know. Uh, it's let's say it's in uh, Taurus in the seventh house. Okay, then we would just look at Taurus and seventh house. We kind of ignore Mars is even there. We just consider it a placeholder. So we don't need to focus on the meaning of Mars. Why? because it's implicit in our understanding of Aries because there's a lot of overlap in meaning between Mars and Aries. So we just think of the ruler as a placeholder and now we have additional information, which would be Taurus and the seventh house. So let's use a different example. Let's say the south node of the moon is in the fourth house. And let's say uh, the planet that rules the south node sign is in the ninth house. So fourth house deals with family dynamics. So this person was probably defined by family, there's fourth house, but more specifically defined by religion of the family because ninth house deals with belief systems and religion and higher minded philosophy. So yes, their life was dictated and formed them by family, but basically the ideology of the family. So we could be looking at an example of them being born into a very dogmatic Catholic family in the past life. Okay, so what are the rulerships? You know, uh, again, you can take screenshots of these. I want to be really quick, so I'm not going to go into great detail. Uh, you can study this later, but just quickly: Mars rules Aries, Venus rules Taurus, uh, Mercury rules Gemini, the Moon rules Cancer, the Sun rules Leo. Mercury also rules Virgo, so there's a dual rulership there, and uh, Venus rules Libra too. There's another dual rulership uh, uh, planet. And then uh, Scorpio rules is ruled by Pluto and Mars. Okay, well, I guess technically that's the dual rulership, but I misspoke there a second when I was talking about Mercury and Venus. But uh, so yeah, Pluto and Mars rule Scorpio. That's gonna be interesting. We'll have to take a look at that. Like what does that mean and when we have to uh, deal with two rulers? And then Jupiter rules Sag, Saturn rules Capricorn. Another dual rulership here, a couple of them. Uranus and Saturn both rule Aquarius and Neptune and Jupiter both rule Pisces. What about planets in aspect to the south node? You know, you look at a chart and you see all these lines in the middle of the chart, it gets kind of confusing. Um, and there are many different aspects and you can defer back to that key, I guess you can say, where I had all the symbols, I had all the aspects there as well. And, um, except for the conjunction, which I already mentioned when the planet is next to the south node, all the aspects to the south node refer partly to forces that acted upon the person in the prior life. OK, 
Okay? They point to external realities. Although sometimes, as we'll see in my example later, they're also uh, connected to a subjective, more personal correlates as well. So, you know, since so much of the human experience is often about relationships, more often than not, these planets refer to, to people, you know, other people. And we can start to add some window dressing to the story and other people involved that might have caused some skipped lessons and stuff like this, okay? And these are human interactions that played some kind of shaping role within the person's experience. Okay. Now, here's another critical point. Me personally, in my own professional practice, I focus primarily on the major aspects, the conjunction, the square, and the opposition. Those are the main ones. Those are the more heated ones. You can use sextiles and trines, for example, which I do talk about in my, my full uh, four-hour webinar, but we don't have time for that. And, and in all honesty, um, in my professional practice, I rarely look at them because um, I, we can add more window dressing if we need, but um, the, these major aspects is where we'll find the major thrust of the story. And I find just, we have to do a process of elimination during you know, the actual uh, presentation of the information. And I find these to be the most meaningful. Now, squares in opposition add tension and friction within the storyline and they correspond with people or situations uh, that, which were experienced as challenges, resistances, or negativity. Let's get more specific though. What about if they're opposite the south node? We have a planet directly opposite the south node. Implicit in that is they're conjunct in the north node. So um, the planet opposing the south node represents something or someone who blocked, repressed, defeated, or tricked the person in the past life. It represents something insurmountable or unattainable, okay? And this is what I usually, how I usually describe it is, it represents the brick wall of reality that this person simply could not get around, you know? And we can use different examples, you know, something farthest from us, unattainable, unreachable, yeah. Maybe you have Venus opposite the south node, the goddess of love. It is the relationship planet among other things, okay? This could be represent unrequited love or a feeling of being unreachable. Yeah. What about the insurmountable? Well, with Venus, we could be looking at a partner where that was quite vexing or controlling. Okay. It really depends on the rest of the symbols to uh, lead us to which one of these it was. Okay. So what about squares? Planet square the south node. I know I'm hitting you with a lot of information quick, but I'm trying to pack a lot of info in here. So pause, take notes, pause, take notes. <laughs> so square is the south node. And um, with this aspect, okay, um, we're, we're looking at uh, a person again, or probably a person or circumstance or issue that was really at cross purposes with them. You know, that was vexing, that afflicted or undercut the intentions or needs of the other person in the past life. Okay. And it is therefore an issue unresolved in the past life. Okay, which is commonly in both schools of evolutionary astrology. There are two different ones. I'm in the Stephen Forrest school, by the way. Uh, it's known as a skip step, the square. Okay. So, of course, we want to work with that in the current life, you know, in a more evolved way. So, another example Neptune square the nodes. Okay. Neptune in the fourth house. We could be looking at an endlessly uh, uh, needy or manipulative mother who depended on the child later in life, okay, when she didn't really need it. Okay. What about the fifth house? We could be looking at uh, addiction as a skip step or alcohol abuse instead of reaching the, the flower at their full potential. And with squares, we recognize that other options exist as well. You know, the manipulative mom could have been, uh, you know, told to uh, stand on her own two, two feet. Okay. Boundaries could have been set. Okay. In terms of drinking too much, well, you know, we can... <laughs> We can heroically break those addictions, easier said than done for a lot of us, especially with Neptune square, the notes. So quick example, uh, south node in the seventh house, seventh house traditionally known as the house of marriage and intimacy. And there it is squaring the Neptune in the fourth house. And one dark uh, Neptune potential, which we'll discover when we start going through all the plants and stuff, uh, can be self-sacrifice. You know, the, the story of Jesus being uh, nailed to the cross. It's martyr energy in the seventh house of marriage. OK, 
Okay, we could be looking at a possibility of staying in a marriage because of beliefs in religion, for example. Okay, also can indicate a, a sort of a loss of self as this self-sacrificial blending into the needs of the others in the family and almost feeling like a ghost in your own life. So the quick recap of the step-by-step -step method I'm talking about here, okay? Again, you wanna do this in order, it helps do it in order. You know, that's why, that's why I say step-by-step -step. because you can look at a chart and it's chocked full of so much information. It's so easy to look at a chart and go splat. So by having the step-by-step -step method, we can just you know, stay to the course and just take a little bit at a time and work with it. Take a bite, chew it, take a bite, chew it. And of course it'll digest within you as something else entirely, you know, but just a little bit at a time. So first things first, understand the sign, uh, the sign of the South Node, okay? Again, gives us a feeling of that person's nature in the past life and what it felt like to be them. Analyze the house that the South Node is in. Gives us the sense of where in the person's life these dynamics were playing out. And then see if there's a planet conjunct the South Node, if it adds extra information to the sign of the South Node itself. And this builds an understanding of the character of the person and also what it felt like to be them. Now, tie in the house and sign of the planet or planets that rule the South Node. Add even more perspective to the story and analyze any planet in aspect to the South Node through the square or opposition to uncover any additional tension or friction in the story. Okay. I know that seems like a lot, and it is when you're juggling, juggling the symbols. But, you know, here we have a five-step process, you know. That's the easy part. The hard part is trying to find the integration, of course. And then you, you start pulling the threads of the karmic story together. And as I said, it's easy to hit the chart and go splat. You know, it's a very overwhelming process. But you just have to keep grounded and realize this is simply just a process of elimination. You know, with each new piece of the puzzle, the possibilities of what this person life was like narrow tremendously. So part of it's discovery, the other part of it is strategic elimination. And the way I like to think about this is it's kind of like a Venn diagram. If you think back to math school, you know, in high school math class, and uh, you have all these circles and all the circles meet in that honey spot in the middle. Okay. So each of the symbol of astrology that you're looking back, the ruler, the sides, the houses, all, all these pieces of the puzzle, okay? Each one, each of these pieces, the signs, the houses, et cetera, represent vast pools of symbolic archetypal meaning. And our goal here is to juggle these pools of meaning, find out where these pools of meaning overlap, creating a big theme, Okay, and then focus on those themes to narrow down what that story must have been like, okay, and parse out those themes to build the story around them, okay, the semi fictional storyline, okay. I mean, it's, it's very common if I'm doing this reading to one of my clients that they stop me halfway through and say, wait, wait, are you talking about this life or the past life, you know, because there, again, history repeats itself. It's, it's very accurate, actually, even though it is semi fictional. Okay, now we get to the fun part, uh, you know, the overwhelming part. I guess this has probably already been overwhelming for some of you, but um, uh, astrology's biggest bottleneck is trying to understand what the heck the 10 planets, 12 houses, and 12 signs of the zodiac even mean. And there's a cursory understanding of these things, but, you know, the, these, uh, you know, 34 symbols here and the nodes, so 36, uh, is a lifelong study, you know, if you're that interested. So I'm going to start um, running through these. And again, I recommend taking screenshots of these for study because I'm going to just kind of blow through this because I want to make it on time here. Um, so I'll, I won't read all of this, obviously. You can look at this later. But these are uh, words you can connect to that can bring you into what it means, what these symbols mean, basically. You know? So for example, Let's say the sun was conjunct the south node. Remember, it adds additional information of what this character must have been like. So it represents a person that was characterized. It had these qualities here, you know, both some positive and some negative. Or let's say uh, the sun is square opposition the south node. This might be some external solar sun force. It might be looking at a situation that was more characterized by these planets. 
Okay, so it can, it can go a lot of different avenues. But, you know, if we just, I'll just riff on the symbols for a little bit. You know, the sun is the center of the solar system. All the planets orbit the sun. It represents power. It represents charisma. It represents uh, um, luminosity, warmth, and gravity. So gravitas, you know, people, strong solar people have that quality of bigness about them, you know. Um, and they shine brightly into the world. They might, and the sun is a star. So it depends on, you know, where it is in the story, but they might've been a literal star, which we'll see in our example a little bit later. And then the moon is very nurturing. Moon, the great mother. It deals with, it connects with family uh, influences and responsibilities. It links to clan, it links to home. Uh, the healer archetype is really strong. So if somebody has a, moon conjunct the south node they might have been in some sort of healing uh dynamic or taking care of other people that's a beautiful thing but that can get us into trouble as well you know uh and then mercury you know mercury is the fastest planet in the solar system at least the ones that go around the sun once every 88 days it orbits the sun so it represents mind the quick mind lightning fast reflexes it also represents the ability to improvise uh, language and its difficulties improvisation, youthfulness, sheer energy and life force. It's speedy, okay? Venus, the, oops, Venus, the goddess of love, okay? Goddess of beauty too. You know, Venus is the most beautiful thing in the sky, except for maybe the moon. It's that bright star, you know, it looks like a star. So it represents attractiveness. So if somebody has Venus conjunct the uh, south node, there they might have been a model or, or somebody known to be very beautiful. And of course, that can create complications as well. It's also the divine feminine. Could be an indication that the person was a, a female in the past life. It's also a relational sign, the goddess of love. So we're looking at relationship dynamics in this story as well. And since we want to look at this uh, suspiciously, what's the dark side of relationship dynamics? You know, so sometimes it, it can be represented as codependent relationships, too much compromise or self-sacrifice. You know, it can go in a lot of different directions. But again, you can just look to a person characterized by, you know, situation characterized by. And I invite you to really study these things because you can take one of these planets and just go into contemplation mode for, you know, ever. <laughs> And the goal here is these planets represent archetypes. And these arch each one of these archetypes is a multifaceted diamond. And there's high-end expressions of all the archetypes. There's low-end expressions of all the archetypes. It's important to know all of them. But the South Node story is especially good at focusing a little bit more on the negative, again, just to see what went wrong for you. Mars, person characterized by courage. Okay, What did it feel like to be them? Heated. You know, maybe they had some anger issues, passionate people, intensity, desire, heat, could, could be linked to violence, protectiveness. Um, Mars conjunct the south node often makes me think the person was a man in the past life, you know. Um, and um, it's also linked to conflict, sometimes war in the past life as well through the rulership of Aries, like I talked about before. Aries the warrior, here we find Mars the war god. And then Jupiter, the second biggest body in the solar system besides the sun. So it also links to a certain bigness, you know, but it's not quite as big as the sun. And actually Jupiter almost became a star. It almost had that runaway effect. We almost had a binary solar system, you know? So uh, uh, it's, uh, it also is represented the, that quality of bigness of, of, of also linked to charisma as well, okay? Ambition, somebody who's very compelling, okay? Oops. It also be linked to uh, great success and prestige as well, if the rest of the symbols support that, okay? Now, uh, Saturn is, uh, as I talked about before, Saturn conjunct the Aries South node, kind of the war general, you know, uh, connected to that seriousness, that stoicism, that long suffering, you know, that, that stern father archetype, as I described it before, at least when it's in the sign of Aries, it's linked to conservatism. And um, when, uh, sorry, I keep doing that. I keep hitting the wrong button here. Um, a situation characterized by extreme lack, heavy responsibility, sometimes physical coldness, starvation. You know, Saturn's known as the greater malefic and it represents basically the hard face of reality. 
And that's the type of reality that we try to hide our children from, you know, it's linked to uh, maturity too, but maturity usually stems from that realization that, uh, you know, life is very hard sometimes. So usually with Saturn in, in a big way in the story, the storyline gets pretty heavy and repressive and oppressive, okay? Uranus, when that's in the storyline, things are a bit shocking. Uranus, the god of earthquakes and lightning bolts is linked to, as you can see here, unsuspected developments. Shock, rebellion, influence of troublemakers, sometimes sudden trauma. Like if I see Uranus square or oppose the south node, I typically think that this person was traumatized in a big way, you know, uh, suddenly. It's like the dam breaks, the water floods through the land and changes the landscape forever. So sometimes there's those sudden shock moments where we get shell shocked and we're like, I can't believe my eyes. That happens, probably happened to all of us in at least a couple of our past lives, the sudden event that really marked and gashed the soul for them to really heal in the current life in certain ways. Now, this class isn't so much focused on the healing component. That's more understanding the North Node. For this class, we're just trying to understand how to read the karmic past. If you want to understand how to work with the medicine, the karmic medicine, the North Node, that's available in that uh, other class I mentioned before on my website. Okay, Neptune, the god of the sea, which is a metaphor for the sea of consciousness. It's linked to mysticism, very vivid imagination, higher dimensions of reality and psychic perceptions, okay? uh, psychic sensitivity. And some people open psychically faster than they can handle, you know, and that's why it's also linked to drunkenness and addiction and escapism, okay? So some people are led to numbing behavior because uh, they're psychically attuned to the pain of the world. So is it spirit or spirits? You know, that's the polarity with a strong Neptune or even Pisces too, because Neptune rules Pisces, okay? And Neptune is sometimes linked to uh, all of these circumstances from time to time. You'll see, you'll see it manifest, all these planets manifest in slightly different ways, always within their archetypal field but in slightly different ways in all the stories. Again, what way does it manifest? It depends on the rest of the symbols. Where do the Venn diagram, where do all these faceted diamonds overlap in meaning within the center of the Venn diagram, creating these primary themes uh, for which you're meant to build your uh, story upon? And Pluto, the god of hell. You know, uh, Pluto past lives could be distilled into one word and that's intense. Okay, psychologically intense. And it deals with extremity. It deals with dark forces, a nightmare, especially if I see Pluto opposite or square the south node, I think, oh my God, this person went through another nightmare. And since it's the planet of extremity, when it's really activated in the nodal structure, their life was in the extreme. I take all the symbols, not just Pluto, but really it it makes me accentuate, become a little bit more heavy handed in the darkest possibilities of the, of the symbols, okay? Pluto has a beautiful side to it too, but again, we're, we're looking at the negative here. Okay, now let's get to the houses. First house is the house of leadership, okay? Um, so if we have the south node in the, in the uh, first house, we're looking at somebody that had to make certainly decisions for themselves, but also for other people too, okay? And fundamental to understanding a first house past life is that they didn't, they didn't have uh, relationship dynamics where other people felt equal to them. It felt more like leader to follower or CEO to worker, or, you know, uh, it's just a sign of autonomy, independence, uh, responsibility. Uh, and it, it, this often creates a feeling of loneliness at the top, okay, because of the power, because of the authority, okay. And Sometimes it's a link to uh, fateful crossroads and choice points. And sometimes we got to make a brutal decision. It feels like a lose-lose and we take the lesser of two evils, you know, and that can leave a heavy mark on the soul as well. And then the second house, house of money, traditionally, and that's a big part of it. Um, you know, my immediate question with South Node in the second house is, is it a lot of money or a little money? You know, each one of those pathways creates uh, different sets of complications. Um, Let's say we have uh, uh, Saturn conjunct the south node in the second house, the planet of lack, you know, I'm probably thinking that this person lived on, you know, crumbs, you know, was in line at the bread line, you 
you know, uh, and was in extreme forms of poverty. Again, if the rest of the symbols support it. Um, but what if they have Jupiter conjunct the South Node in the second house? Well, they run a big pile of cash or maybe grain or whatever they were considering of value or currency then, okay? So it's commonly connected to money and on some level. Also, we contemplate the psycho-spiritual understanding of the second house where it's known as the house of insecurity. Outward security and inner security, they have an effect on each other. They're bound. So net worth and self-worth. So when I look at South Node in the second house in the context of your journey, I think that you in, that insecurity prevented you from becoming what you needed to become in the past life, okay? That's the lesson. So therefore in the current life, you're trying to learn to become more secure in yourself, you know? And there's ways of doing that reflected in your chart as a whole, but we're starting to understand, okay, what was the stumbling block for us in the past life? So external security, internal security, second house. Third house is, has a strong correlation with the planet Mercury. I talked about it before because Mercury rules the third house. You know, zippy Mercury once every 88 days around the sun. Third house is as distinctions, of course, but it has a similar, let's say, energetic texture or what the life must have been like where it required constant improvisation, a lot of learning, data in, maybe data out as well. Maybe they had some sort of teaching role if the rest of the structure supports that. Or maybe they were a writer. Or maybe if they were more well-known, you know, maybe there's that leadership piece in the first house. They have the ruler in the first house, for example, and therefore leader to follower. And maybe we have, and then their, their south knows in the third house, maybe they're on the podium, you know, maybe they're making speeches to people, okay? It's also connected to reading and speaking and curiosity and youth. But I mean, there's all those listed there. But when it, we get into the feeling state of what is a third house past life like, it's a life defined by the constant immediate and the emergent. It still has that quickness to it. There's a sense of, with South Node in the third house, of drinking from the fire hose, a lot of busyness, busy, 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 then dead, you know, is kind of the feeling to it, which can create all kinds of problems uh, in terms of to resolve or heal in the current life. For example, maybe an overwhelmed nervous system. Sometimes I see that a lot too. What about the fourth house? Fourth house, classically known as the house of home, family, hearth, and clan. It's ruled by Moon, the great mother, which I talked about before. So it's linked to home life. And with South Node in the fourth house, I think, oh my God, right away, this is where I go to first. And then the other symbols might guide me away from this. But nine times out of 10, this is the bullseye. This person in the past life was utterly defined by family, under the thumb of family. Family expectations eclipsed this person. And in some way, shape, or form, they were unable to leave their, lead their own life. Their life was scripted for them by family. I used that example before, you know, fourth house and ninth house, defined by the family, the ruler in the ninth house, defined by the family religion. And then the other pieces of the puzzle add even more nuance. Fifth house, house of creativity, okay? Or the identity as an artist. I see that quite a bit, okay? Um, it's also linked to children. So let's say I just talked about the fourth house of family. South node in the fourth house of family, maybe the ruler's in the fifth house of children. You know, maybe Saturn's in the mix too to add that responsibility. So the crushing weight of uh, being a parent, maybe having too many kids or maybe doing it alone or something like that. You know, I see that a lot as well. And the fifth house is known as the house of pleasure and the house of fun, okay? And of course, we can get into trouble with too much pleasure and too much fun, you know? And if there's other symbols that meet the fifth house of pleasure in the bullseye of the Venn diagram, like an unhealthy Neptune addiction, unhealthy Jupiter's linked to excess or, or too much of something, then we could be looking at a lifetime of, of living, being a party animal, <laughs> basically. And sixth house, I briefly talked about before, it's linked to hierarchical systems, uh, weighty duties and responsibility, a feeling of servitude, um, a feeling as though in the past life they were under orders. That's a really key line to, to think about. I feel like I'm under orders. If it's really heavy with like a strong Pluto and Saturn square and opposite the south node, we could be looking at literal slavery perhaps. So that's the sixth house. Seventh house, house of marriage, as I described it before, house of partnership. 
So when I discussed the fourth house, I said under the thumb of family. Well, this is kind of similar under the thumb of marriage, you know, another person to find you. You know, example would be Mrs. John Smith or the henpecked husband. You know, there could be many examples, but those are two that come to mind. And typically, since we want to read the symbols more negatively or askance, the shadow side of the seventh house, it's relationships built on inequality as opposed to equality. Okay, so codependent issues probably. Eighth house, also linked to nightmare circumstances sometimes because Pluto rules the eighth house is also a, a, a deeply sexual compassion to the eighth house. So we should be, we could be looking at um, sexuality as a generator of negative karma if the eighth house is really activated. It's also le linked to deep coupling and bond bonding and psychological intensity. It's also known as the house of death. So if I see a really sudden violent signature with the rest of the symbols, we might be looking at premature death that ripped somebody too early out of life, okay? Um, if there's some Neptunian or sh other shamanic things going on here, we could be looking at uh, shamanism or the occult. Ninth house, talked about it before, house of religion. Okay, so uh, we, we look at that more suspicious meaning and say, we say dogma, you know, this person was in a position where they expected, they were expected or felt they had all the answers, you know, kind of the preacher or know-it-all archetype. It doesn't have to be about in terms of what we believe God to be. We can be religious about anything. We can make a God out of money, you know, be a materialist. We can make a, a God out of uh, science, you know, uh, the scientific method. We can make a God out of being a cynic or an atheist or whatever. It doesn't just have to be about spiritual belief systems. Again, look to the rest of the symbols. You know, If you have a Gemini South node, a very cerebral intellectual sign, because it's on the mental plane, a Gemini South node in the ninth house, we might be looking at somebody who got tripped up in the dogma of intellectualism, okay? It's also linked to um, education. So maybe they were like a scholarly teacher or something that had a very narrow bandwidth in terms of how they viewed reality and that got him into trouble. 10th house. Sorry, I'm moving quickly here. I'm trying to get as much information as I can. 10th house, classically known as the house of career, mission, relationship to the community, but it's very visible. It's the most visible place in the chart. So it makes me think of fame in the past life, especially if this is supported by other powerful planets, this person was probably famous in the past life. Now, were they, you know, worldwide famous or name we'd all recognize? Maybe. More likely, though, they're just squished into some history book in some library. You know, history remembers them to what degree we don't know, whether it was their city, their state, or their country, or the world, but they were famous. They were well known in their community, however large that was. And the key takeaway was that they were defined by their public role, you know, and people projected onto them certain images, certain expectations about what they were meant to do, you know, so the expectations of the public were a heavy influence on these people typically. 11th house, similar to the 10th house in that it is connected to the sea of people. The 11th house is known as the house of friends, which we can use as a useful metaphor here for the group consciousness and herd mentality, okay? Tribalism, okay? And peer pressure. So, uh, caving under the expectations of a cultural understanding of what they're meant to do with their life, you know. Yes, a life scripted for them, but mainly by cultural influences, you know, and we're all affected by the environment in which we're born and grow up in, you know, but this with South Node or the ruler in the 11th house, there's a particular emphasis on this group think shaping that person's life. 12th house. Um, you know, the 12th house, as all the houses, go by many different names and different layers to them. It is the house of consciousness and different levels of consciousness, house of spiritual awakening, uh, house of, um, you know, I often see, for example, a South Node in the 12th house, a very monastic life. Maybe they were a nun or a monk out in a cave or something. Again, if the rest of the symbols support it, okay. But there's also a heavy understanding of the 12th house. And remember what I said about Pluto. If there's a heavy Pluto in the mix, I look at everything the darkest I can typically, okay? What's the darkest of the 12th house? Great loss and grief. It's known as the house of troubles classically. 
So a loss of everything potentially. Okay, and of course you can have tremendous uh, spiritual um, spike, if you will, through tough experience. They're kind of a paired set, spiritual growth and uh, wisdom through tough experiences. It doesn't always happen that way, but it's pretty common. Uh, also represents a loss of everything, as I said, that can manifest in different ways. Sometimes imprisonment, sometimes wasting illness or hospitals or uh, yeah, or a withdrawal from the world as well, losing your connection to the world, if it's a more spiritual thing, okay? It's also linked to addiction through its connection through uh, Pisces and Neptune, okay? So drunkenness, addiction, hiding, confinement, okay? On to the signs. Aries, the sign of courage. Aries, the warrior. And warriors are defiant. They're protective. What did it feel like to be this person? Individualistic, intense, fiery. Okay, we can take Aries in so many different directions. It depends on the over, overarching tone of the storyline. But a key takeaway that we can get from Aries South Node is this person was staunchly independent, you know. Um, it's one of the most independent signs in the zodiac. There are others that connect to that as well. So maybe an ego-centered attachment to independence and autonomy. You know, I can do this alone. I don't need your help, you know, back off, you know. So we see that too, okay? And, um, you know, I did use an example as a potentially a militaristic past life, you know, because, you know, if the rest of the symbols connect with that, we, we see that a lot, okay? But in terms of what did it feel like to be this person, what is the negative uh, emotional set this person juggled with in some way is typically anger and fear and, and aggression, sometimes too aggression, too much aggression. Like maybe they broke uh, broad to nuclear warheads to a peace treaty, you know, <laughs> not literally, obviously, but, you know, you know, they're uh, use too much force. So therefore, in this life, they're learning how to use the right use of force in a more balanced way and less destructive. Taurus. Uh, it's linked to dogmatism too, okay? Typically Sagittarius is, but, um, or classically known, but, you know, Taurus is a, it's a fixed sign. It's, it's the most stubborn sign in the zodiac. You'll read that everywhere online or in all the pop astrology books. And, and it is true because it is linked to a fixity sign, fixity energy. Taurus, a sign that loves stability in their life, but they can become attached to that. And this creates a general refusal to adapt in their past life. Like Kodak film from the 1980s and before. Where are they today? Pretty much non-existent. Why? Because they refused, you know, to kind of nose as high up in the air. Oh, we're not gonna do digital media, you know? Uh, and poof, there they went, no longer around. So their refusal to the adapt where there was their downfall. So we look at Taurus suspiciously in the past life and that might be what was going on there. You know, there's kind of a, a link to ancestry there. Like if it worked for my grandparents, it worked for me, you know, it's, 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 it's stuck. You know, there's a stuckness with Taurus if we look at it suspiciously. If we look at it more neutrally or even positively, if the rest of the story supports it or structure, we could be looking at a very like living in nature sort of life or agrarian culture too. Okay, it is the sign of nature. Gemini, the most curious sign in the zodiac, linked to youthfulness. Okay, it is on the mental plane, as I said. So maybe it's connected to a fascination with uh, language, an openness to change. This person probably packed the experience of many lifetimes into one, constantly moving around. But Gemini energy, what's the shadow side of constantly moving around and th following those threads of curiosity? Well, they can spin in circles. There can be a dispersal of energy. They can spin too many plates and it can cause this torrent of energy in their head, you know, and they can become easily distracted. And it could be, uh, you know, getting caught up in uh, a loss of perspective, uh, over, an, uh, hunger for stimulation. You know, that'll come up, I, I think, in our example that I'll use later here. Uh, it can be linked to, because it is an air sign on the mental plane, intellectualism, like I use in the other example, you know, in the ninth house, the dogma of the scholarly intellectual, okay? Oh, I keep doing that, sorry. Cancer, 
Cancer with a strong affinity or overlap in meaning with the fourth house, because cancer is the fourth sign. So this is nurturing instincts. Remember the fourth house was house of family. Well, cancer has an affinity to that. You know, the love of home, the love of children, the love of the homeland. Okay. There also is a protective instinct to the mom too, because there's a, this may be somebody that was protecting the weak and defenseless who couldn't defend themselves. Now, Negatively, this person could have uh, fallen into the trap of fear, okay? Feeling insecure, also linked to family dynamics as well, okay? You know, the, the cancer is ruled to the mother archetype, nurturing, okay? So we look at that suspiciously. What's the dark side of the mother archetype? Endlessly taking care of everybody else and not taking care of themselves, okay? Giving, 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 giving and never receiving. And that one's very common. Again, it depends on the rest of the symbols, but I see that one a lot, okay? So therefore in the current life, it behooves them to have a more balanced relationship with the energy they give uh, uh, with that of what they receive from other people, as well as take care of them damn selves instead of everybody else. Yeah, that's cancer energy. And also cancer is known as the crab. And a crab is a sensitive creature. It exists without, uh, because it has a shell. Without the shell, it would be in, an endangered species. It would be in a lot of trouble. Um, so another shadow side potential of cancer is hiding inside the shell of a crab because of fear um, and living too safe of a life. I see that sometimes too. Leo. The hunger to express oneself, the hunger to seek applause and attention. Of course, that can get us into trouble if that's a, uh, an ego-centered attachment, okay? It's also linked to pride and arrogance and self-importance. You know, expectations associated with a high position, especially if like there's a strong Jupiter or fame, sun, 10th house, stuff like this, uh, first house of leadership, okay? Just have to find where these symbols connect. What's the center of the Venn diagram? But Leo on the negative side is susceptible to ego inflation. So you will see that quite a bit. And Leo is known as the king of the beasts. So we might be looking at king energy, a lifetime of privilege. You know, maybe they were in a monarchy or a royal family or some aristocratic family, maybe the upper crust of society. And lifetimes like that are fraught with expectations about what is proper behavior. You know, Think about um, the princess of the royal family. How much freedom does she experience in her life? You know, not very much, you know, is it, at least in back in the day during the feudal system, you know, or whatever. It's like, ah, uh, you're gonna grow up, you're gonna be the princess, you're eventually you're gonna be the queen, you're gonna marry this very particular person from the neighboring country because we wanna form a strong alliance, you know? So the expectations of that enriched sort of lifetime in terms of privilege and status. I see that one too, a lot. Virgo, um, Virgo, the virgin archetype is the main one. It has nothing to do with sexuality. It's just that historically sexuality was seen as this exalted state of purity. So it's the sign of purity. Language we connect to more uh, quickly is uh, the idea of the perfectionist. Virgo is the sign of the perfectionist. Comparison with the actual and the ideal. Here's the actual, here's the real, okay? So high attention to detail, both in your external environment as well as your internal one. And that can be if you link to, you know, people setting too high of a standard for themselves. So high that they could never meet it or reach it. So what does it feel like to be a Virgo in the past life? Well, uncomfortable. You know, here's what I am. Here's what I should be. It's linked to words like worry, concern, and feelings low consciousness feelings of Virgos, worry, concern, sometimes guilt and shame. So we'll use that example I had before, fourth house, ninth house, a lifetime defined by family, the religion of the family, the strict Catholic family, let's say Virgos in the mix too, the sign most susceptible to guilt and shame. I use the example of the strict Catholic family. Well, that's an emotion a lot of these families feel. If every time you sneeze wrong, you think you're going to hell, you know, that can lead, it doesn't always, but it can lead to guilt and shame, which is a, a very um, low response to Virgo energy. So is worry and concern. 
So if somebody has a Virgo South node, they're trying to get over that worry and concern, that sort of emotional residue that's still in their astral body in the current life carry over from the past life, trying to heal that. Libra. Libra, the sign of the platform balance. Libras like to keep things in balance. And there's many ways Libras can do that, but it is a, it is a traditionally relationship oriented sign. So balanced, harmonious relationships is typically a motivation or a drive for Libran folks is to keep balance in their relationships. And they're very likable people typically, you know, because they know how to get along with a lot of different personality types. And that's a, that's a you know, you got to remember signs are, are psychological. They're motivational. They orient us to life and underlie the decisions we make. So Libra's motivation to connect with people, to have these harmonious relationships, that's a beautiful thing. They make wonderful counselors, for example, but it can also get us into trouble when we take it to extremes with the South Node. We want to think about it more negatively in the negative extreme where they gave too much of their power. Again, too much compromise, too much loss of self, too much passive aggressive behavior, which probably led to some resentment inside of themselves. Resentment that they're trying to heal in the current life through a strong response to their birth chart, to the North Node of the Moon, all these, all these pieces of the puzzle that, that we're, we work on in our birth chart. Scorpio, the scorpion, you know, it kind of gets us right into the mood of Scorpio. You know, it's, it's, it's charged. It's psychologically intense. And we look at Scorpio more uh, suspiciously or negatively. The shadow side of Scorpio, at least emotionally, is getting lost in the turbulent subset of emotions and getting into this moody and broody place. So if you have a South Node in Scorpio, your life was somewhat of a psychodrama. And why? Well, we look to the rest of the pieces of the puzzle. But that psychodrama led to an ego-centered attachment to your own inner complexity, okay? psychological complexity, and you got lost in your internal world, the choppy waters of your subjective reality in the past life. Why? Because there was a bit of a psychodrama around you. And therefore, in this life, you're trying to calm that down, you know. That's when we start getting into the karmic medicine stuff. But certainly in the past life, um, these people got a PhD in psychology without ever needing to go to school for it to get the fancy letters behind their name, just through the human experience. And it got them into trouble and got them into that moody, broody place, which of course can be uh, emotionally damage, damaging if we stay there for too long. Sagittarius. You know, the, it does have a strong affiliation with um, the ninth house, which I talked about, house of religion. You know, the, the Sagittarius is known as the philosopher archetype, and it is the sign of religion. So it is also linked to dogmatic uh, certainty, rigid opinion, sometimes impulsiveness. You know, Sagittarian people are classic for foot and mouth moments and making really dumbass mistakes. I'm not making fun of them. I'm a Sag, you know, I, I feel justified to poke fun at myself and, and my fellow Sages. But uh, yeah, they can be a little foolhardy at times. You know, that's just the Sag path, making really interesting mistakes and learning from them. What mistakes? Again, look to the rest of the story, okay? Sometimes they're irresponsible. Sometimes they get lost in fundamentalism of any sort. They can be a bit mature, okay? So, We'll get into a little bit of Sag when we get to our example. Capricorn, you see no motivated negatively by here, uh, time serving, pointless endurance. You know, Capricorn's the sea goat, kind of an impossible creature, but you know, you can climb, climb any mountain, cross any ocean. It's the symbol of endurance. Capricorn people can endure so much, you know so much that their heart begins to harden. And that, when we look at it suspiciously in the karmic story, we look at the idea that there was probably, there was a calcification in their heart, okay? And they grew a stoic acceptance to the hand they were dealt. It was probably a crappy hand to a certain degree. Now, did they play the victim card? No, that's not Capricorn. Capricorn sucks it up. 
pushes the pain body aside, says, I'm on top of it, drop it, you know, that's Capricorn energy, okay? And it led to a variety of different emotions associated with Capricorn, can be loneliness, can be depression, can be control issues. We got to look to the rest of the symbols to help us hang our hat on which way that went. But where we can be pretty sure is that there was a hardening of the heart. Aquarius. That's going to be in our example here in a second. I'll talk about it in more greater detail, but it's the rebel archetype. You know, it's about bucking the system, being different. Okay. And sometimes uh, we find commonly, I see it a lot in the past life stories with Aquarius South Node, where people were much different than their culture or family of origin in which they were born but they weren't able to really manifest their own uniqueness to the way that they were that was possible for them, which led to a certain level of alienation where they felt like an utter outsider or exile in their own life. And it led to a dissociative state, okay? Also linked to trauma, also linked to coldness, uh, a leaving of their heart space, much like Capricorn. They're interesting, they're both ruled by Saturn. You know, so there is that connection there. Um, but with Aquarius, it's more, I'm going to be more comfortable in my head rather than heart because Aquarius is an air sign, okay, and getting into those dissociative states. And Pisces, the mystic, the dreamer, the poet, and the drunk, you know, <laughs> strong connection to the 12th house, okay. Um, it is a sign negatively motivated by escapism, self numbing behaviors. Okay. can be pretty vague, sometimes spineless jellyfish energy with Pisces, can be uh, overly dreamy, you know, getting lost in the dream world. It is uh, connected to weakness. Again, this is all very negative stuff. Pisces is actually one of my favorite signs to talk about because it does have an extreme high end and an extreme low end. The extreme high end is cosmic consciousness, you know, a saint becoming the mystic, somebody who meditates a lot and uh, raises their consciousness. You know, people who have strong Pisces energy in their chart are playing for high stakes, you know, but it can also get us into trouble. Yeah. So the whole polarity between a uh, saint or the town drunk is connected with Pisces, also connected to the 12th house and Neptune, these family of archetypes. We've pointed out here that there are many distinctions but all these family of archetypes are gonna have some connection between them, always. Okay, so now we get to our chart example. Now I'm sure all your eyes have turned glassy. You know, Luckily, this is a YouTube video. You can just hit pause, assimilate, take notes, hit pause, <laughs> back and forth, back and forth. So I just data dumped you hard. Now let's put it into action. You know, let's, uh, let's practice the five step method that I just gave you. And we're gonna use a chart example here. Now notice I blacked out the name and the date and the name down here too. And I will reveal who this person is after we've discussed the karma. But so, for, so, you know, at the beginning here, it's gonna be a mystery man or a mystery woman. So what's step number one in our five step process? Where's the south node of the moon? The south node, as I described before, is this horseshoe shape right here, okay? And as we can see, it's in the sign of Aquarius and it's in the 12th house. Now, you'll notice that it's very near the ascendant here. For, for those of you who uh, don't know, this is the ascendant, the sign that's off to the left of the chart between the first and the 12 houses. But, and this is a technicality I didn't have time to get into, uh, but it's not close enough to the ascendant for me to consider it an, uh, a conjunct the ascendant. I use a two and a half degree orb, but it's farther than two and a half degrees. If you considered it conjunct the ascendant, I wouldn't beat you up for it. I mean, it's pretty darn close, but fundamentally, since we're sticking to the method here, south node in the 12th house in Aquarius. So Aquarius, I just talked about it. This person was a rebel and there's a trinity of archetypes commonly associated with Aquarius. I've talked about it on my YouTube channel a lot. By the way, I'll put a link to my YouTube channel too, or I release bi-weekly uh, lunation cycle videos, every new moon, every full moon. I talk about the current astrological weather. So Aquarius, known as the, the rebel, known as the revolutionary, 
the genius and the criminal. Yeah, those are the connection of the three there. Revolutionaries, genius and criminal. Oh my God, what's the connection there? Well, if you look at famous revolutionaries in our past, they all had a perspective, a unique perspective to share with the world. There's the rebel energy. If their perspective was seen to change the shape and flow of humanity in a positive light, they were labeled as geniuses, like Albert Einstein, for example, among many. If they were not seen to change the shape and flow of humanity in a positive light, no shortage of those in human history, they were labeled criminals or they were exiled, you know. So that's the connection of the three archetypes. But however, this person, this mystery person manifested this Aquarian energy, they were different. There's some cliches that apply to this person, both in the past life and the current life, because uh, we got to remember that they're, the South Node is such a point of great charge that, of course, these people are going to manifest these energies in the current life as well. Very powerful place in anybody's chart. So in the past life, they felt that key emotion. What did it feel like to be this person? They felt alienated. They felt like an outsider or an exile in their own life. And that was traumatizing for them. It be they became more comfortable in head rather than heart. You know, I was just talking about this sign. Yeah. And grew this dissociative disorder, you know, where they were, they didn't feel comfortable feeling and they medicated in some way. And we'll look at the rest of the symbols to understand, but that's the pain. What did it feel like to be this person? They felt like an outsider. They felt like that square peg in the round hole. And that can be a tremendous challenge. Aquarians constantly suffer rejection, betrayal and abandonment. You know, it's a, it's a challenge. Okay. And this can happen in a variety of ways. Either they can conform to the expectations of other people and pretend they're someone they're not, or they can manifest the more aggressive form of Aquarius, which is to become the rule breaker, or in the extreme example, the criminal, as I talked about before. So the rebel archetype in the 12th house of consciousness now we're gonna to have to read the 12th house in the extreme way too, because I'm getting ahead of myself, but we do have Pluto opposite the South node. So we will have to look at the house of great loss and troubles. Okay, but let's just do the broad strokes here first. 12th house of consciousness, different levels of consciousness, of spirituality, the spiritual rebel, the rebel mystic, if you will. Okay. Kind of a shamanic feel here, the outsider mystic. Anything to do with Aquarius is about stepping out cultural and familial boundaries. So whatever this person did, from the viewpoint of mainstream culture, they were perceived as very weird and strange and zany. Yeah. And this probably included what they believe, what their beliefs in God were, you know. It's also a 12th house linked to addiction. Yeah. So how do rebels break the rules sometimes? You know, doing things, taking substances they shouldn't. You know, maybe there were substances that altered their level of consciousness. You know, makes me think of psychedelics, for example. Yeah, we might be looking at that. You know, I'm just playing with the symbols here. I'm just spitballing. Okay, so we're starting to get a feel so far about what this person's life was like a little bit. Very vague, that's okay. we got to tie in some more players. And with Aquarius, it's one of those tricky situations where it says the dual rulership because we have the more modern rulership of Uranus. We're gonna to have to take a look at Uranus's placement and also the more uh, classical ruler of Saturn. So let's start with Saturn. And remember, we're not gonna be describing Saturn energy here. We're using it as a placeholder for the sign and house. So just cover up the Saturn if you, if you want, you know, if it's easier for you and just, okay, we're just looking at Gemini and fifth house. And one thing we'll notice is both rulers, Uranus and Saturn are in Gemini. So we got a bunch of votes for Gemini energy here. So that's very prevalent. What's Gemini linked to? Youthfulness, curiosity, spinning in too many circles, spinning too many plates, going in too many directions. It represents the hunger for experience, Gemini does. Actually, both Sag and Gemini, which are opposite signs, have that same foundational makeup to what makes them tick, 
which is the desire, the motivation to have wide ranging experience. They just go about it in different ways, in different styles. So this person's life was hyperactive. It was also very cerebral. Because remember, we're looking for the, the center of the Venn diagram. What's a common thread we've just uncovered? Aquarius, air sign. Gemini, air sign. You know, smart cookie we're looking at here, I believe. Also, uh, Gemini kind of has a playful, flirty quality to it, you know, especially when it's in the fifth house of fun and pleasure and the arts. So this person was probably an artist in the past life. Okay. A very inventive, innovative rebel artist. An artist that breaks all the rules. An artist that has like, how many artists got lost in addiction, for example, just circling it back to the 12th house. They break the rules through addiction and in a very playful, Geminian flirty way, they play their way through life, fifth house of playfulness, creativity, spontaneous self-expression. But when we look at the center of the Venn diagram, the connection between the fifth and 12th houses, I believe, is having too much fun, basically, with some sort of substance. You know, the extreme shadow side of the fifth house is the house of hedonism and debauchery. You know, we can have too good of a time. Why did he want to have too good of a time? Why was he an, an addict to a certain degree? Well, he was wounded somehow. And we'll understand the nature of the wound in a deeper level in a second here. But what, was, what did it feel like, this wound feel like? Aquarius, rejection, betrayal, abandonment, not fitting in, alienation, which led to partying too hardy as the rebel artist. And before we move on to the other ruler, we'll just make a quick stitch here. We also recognize we have the sun in Sagittarius in the 10th house opposite the, south, uh, the Saturn. So remember, any planet opposite or square, the south node itself or its ruler, I don't know if I made that distinction, okay, but that's an important one. Any planet square or opposed, the south node itself or either of the planetary rulers is part of the nodal structure too. Sun, opposite Saturn, okay? Also, again, oppositions, the brick wall of reality we couldn't get around, which led to the addictive tendencies, was the sun, the weight of the world on their shoulders, tremendous responsibility. Responsibility as what? As 10th house, someone famous in the limelight. Now, obviously, I'm using an example of a famous person here because we'll know about this person's life and be able to connect the dots with the past life signature. Um, but this person over the course of probably many lives is no stranger to being famous, okay? The pressure, you know, sun with its sheer gravity, the pressure of fame, okay? A very Sagittarian fame, which is fiery, expressive, gregarious, larger than life. This is how they were perceived. Remember 10th house projections from the public perceived as this larger than life, solar Sagittarian person, which ultimately was the brick wall of reality they couldn't get in, trapped in this life of fame that had a tremendous level of pressure, you know, psychologically, emotionally, on their ego, all that stuff. Okay. And this person was very Sagittarian and Geminian as well as Aquarian, you know, because we want to personalize these uh, signs oftentimes. And, and you know, sometimes I, I did say it before, a planet opposite the south node of the ruler, it's usually somebody else, you know, opposing them. But in this case, if it feels very personal to me. So that's the way I read it this way. We have to use our intuition in this process too. It's a very analytical process, a process of uh, strategic elimination and analysis and stuff. But, you know, you, you'll find as you practice this enough, you, you, your intuition will want to guide you and, and sculpt the story in a very specific way. Okay, what about the other ruler, Uranus? Uranus also in Gemini, I don't need to say much about that. Um, it's next to Mars. We can read this on a couple levels. This person was probably a man in a past life. Here's another one, anger, conflict, warrior energy in the fourth house of home and family. We recognize we also have moon square, the south node. Moon, the great mother. So here we have moon, the planet that naturally rules the fourth house, 
square the south note. And then the ruler in the fourth house too, we can really double down on this idea of family at cross purposes with this person, the reason they felt so alienated. And they were in a very aggressive family. Okay, there's the Mars signature, a very abusive, maybe even physical abusive family, who which which was very controlling. And also Taurus is in the house, remember, stubborn, fixity energy, you know, forceful. Imagine being born a rebel artist into a very conventional family. That's the feeling here of this person's karma. And lastly, it didn't end well. You know, there's Pluto, the god of hell, in, uh, in opposition to the south node. Pluto opposite the south node is one of the hardest ones we can experience, you know, the great trauma. We want to look at all these in extreme light, extreme fame, extreme forms of artistry, extremely dysfunctional family, extreme forms of addiction, you know. And it didn't end well. It ended, it ended in a nightmare. There's Pluto, the planet of nightmares in the sixth house of health. That's something else I didn't mention here. So the debilitated health connected to uh, excess, basically, is what this feels like, okay? And the root origin of uh, a lot of this pain was fame, you know, status, success. You see that with the sun in the 10th house. You also see that with the fact that Pluto's in Leo, you know, privilege. Too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing. You know, that's the storyline. Okay, so um, that's uh, the me take on my take on this chart. And of course, uh, this is a rather short video and I'm trying to distill a pretty complex process into a 90 minute video, which is always very challenging. I talked as fast as I could, only could do one chart example here. Uh, but let's do our grand reveal of who this person is. If my keyboard works, Jim Morrison. So obviously, I mean, it's so interesting because I said it before, it's like I, I do a past life reading and a common thing I'll get is people interrupt me and say, wait, are you talking about the past life or the current life? Because it sounds a lot like my current life. And of course, the way I describe this past life story sounds a lot like Jim Morrison's life that he just lived. Of course, this is his birth chart from that life. So the past life would be the life before Jim. Um, but it's a strong connection, strong overlap in meaning here. And we can gain so much insight as to why he was Jim Morrison, the way he lived the life he did was because mainly because of Aquarius, he's bucking the system. Why was he bucking the system? Because he felt alienated from his family of origin. And I don't know how much any of you know about his backstory, but he was, uh, as Jim, he was born into a highly mil militaristic family. His dad was a very famous war general. And here, Jim, the very shamanic uh, rebel artist born into the family of the war general. And that was the hardest relationship in his life. And uh, it, it uh, led to him living life in the, in the most extreme way possible. And it not ending well, a feeling of great loss of losing everything, you know, and, and premature death and ending in a very Plutonian way because of his excess, because of his extreme, but we recognize the origin of that lies in the alienation from family. And that is something he's been struggling with, juggling in this, in this dance over multiple lifetimes in this particular lesson plan that he's in. So a uh, fascinating uh, chart to look at. So that is, that's the chart example. And welcome to wizardry. You've made it, you know, 90 minute class, go on, start hanging your shingle and do professional readings. You know, obviously it doesn't work out exactly like that, uh, but there's a lot for you to chew on now, a lot to work with. Uh, this takes a lot of practice. You know, when I was first learning this, I would sometimes spend 30 minutes or an hour or more just really diving into the symbols and letting them play in my mind and in my heart and see if I could come to uh, the storyline. And this would be great to practice on yourself, of course, and family members and friends, whoever uh, wants to be your victim, you know, so you, you know, you're, uh, you can practice on them and, and it's fun. You know, it's a great technique. It's a powerful technique. And it helps us to understand what I call the chart behind the chart. It's like, great, we all got these birth charts, wonderful. But why, why do we have these birth charts? And the chart behind the chart, the nodal analysis helps us to answer the question, why? 
why do we have certain current life themes that seem to come back, you know, over and over and over again, because it's that karmic skipping record. So here we are working in wizardry, wizardry in training. And again, if you want to dive deeper, I, I go a lot deeper in the four hour webinar. I tie in the karmic medicine, the North Node, and a lot of other distinctions. I use more chart examples and also answer a lot of questions on that webinar. So I'll leave the link to my website below and to my YouTube channel. And uh, thank you to Stormy Grace and everybody in her audience. This has been an absolute pleasure and I hope I'm invited back someday. Okay, take care.